preach. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to, f- to fulfil what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. So here we have, according to Matthew, the start of Jesus' ministry after his baptism by John the Baptist and then the temptation for 40 days in the wilderness. And we hear from Matthew that Jesus withdrew from Judea, where that took place, to Galilee in the north. And this took place after John the Baptist's arrest. And there, from Jesus' hometown in Nazareth, he comes to Capernaum, a city by the lake, the lake known as the Sea of Galilee. Here, Jesus started declaring the kingdom of heaven, according to Matthew. In other gospels, we hear about the kingdom of God. Sometimes with the Jewish people, they avoided using the word God, and this was more perhaps written with the Jewish people in mind. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the same thing has come near. And here we have this idea that the kingdom is here, the kingdom is now in Jesus, but not yet in its fullness. Again, picture dawn, picture the light, the sun rising, and the sun, the light growing and growing, growing across the land, across the world. This is like the kingdom of God. And the kingdom comes in Jesus, the promised Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. And I always find this remarkable, as prophesied by Isaiah and others 700 years earlier. And Isaiah was talking about the light dawning in Galilee, the light dawning in the darkness, life coming as opposed to the shadow of death, the kingdom advancing. I remembered this morning, as I was standing here, that one of the few places I have seen the dawn and the sunrise was on a beach near Galilee. And I remember with the backdrop of the Jordanian mountains, seeing the darkness before the dawn, and then the first glimpse of dawn, and how the sun, as it rises, lights up the whole area. Again, a beautiful picture of the kingdom of God. What was the darkness that Jesus was referring to? Well, in many ways, he was referring to the darkness of the foreign invaders. It had been the Assyrians who oppressed the land in Isaiah's day. But now the prophecy was about the Roman occupation. The Romans had come almost a hundred years earlier. Jesus is saying to people, knowing our hearts and minds, if you take Rome on in a violent way, the way of the world, to try and bring about God's kingdom, God's reign by force, this will lead to death and destruction. But sadly, they were bent on that. They wanted a warlord Messiah. Jesus was a massive disappointment. Jesus said, repent. Change your thinking. Change your ways. 
change your direction and follow me. Follow my way, the way of God, the way of love. As we touched on in the All Age talk, they didn't. They went the way of force. And it came back and bit them in AD 70, all that destruction. Repentance, the title for today, focusing on the disease rather than the symptoms. Focusing on the disease rather than the symptoms. So, as many of you know, I was a probation officer for 16 years. I worked four years in a local prison. I went to many of the other prisons doing assessments and reports. I worked in Crown Courts and Magistrates Courts. I supervised offenders in the community. I was part of the public protection team, really didn't enjoy that, found that very stressful, supervising and assessing high-risk offenders. I did pre-sentence reports for the courts. The thing I really enjoyed the most was the one-to-one -one work with people and group work running victim awareness groups, anger management groups, substance misuse groups, sex offenders groups, cognitive skills groups, and the whole variety, working with burglars, sex offenders, murderers, drink drivers, drug dealers, fraudsters, and from such diverse backgrounds, literally people who had nothing financially to multi-millionaires who wanted a bit more. The aim of probation back then was more so, and my particular aim was to help, sounds very grand, reduce the risk of reoffending by helping offenders address their offending related problems, whether it be drug, alcohol, alcohol misuse, gambling, anger, unemployment, linked to unemployment, lack of opportunity, lack of skills, lack of training, helping them go in that direction as well. Most of the offenders, don't like calling them offenders actually, most of the people who offended had something likeable about them. They really did. Even with the most horrendous offences, there was always something, or often something likeable. For some not, it was really hard to find. And I had this technique of, might sound strange, picturing them as a baby and how delightful they would have been as a baby, an innocent, and less damaged. Sometimes it helped me see their humanity. Whilst in no way excusing their behaviour, often when I learned about their background, their different backgrounds, I could understand how they'd ended up where they had. One of the more shocking stories, but there were many, is the young man I came to supervise and he told me one day that he came back from school when he was about 13 and his parents had left a note on the dining room table saying, we've moved abroad, all the best for the future. And he went into petty theft, substance misuse, and that became a pattern into his adulthood. Can I tell you something? As a probation officer, I really wanted to make a difference. But over the years, I don't know if I actually helped many people reduce their risk of offending. It was such an unknown. Sometimes you'd supervise them for three years or whatever, and then they would go off into life, and you would never know. But I trust in some ways it did make a difference. But really hard to tell. This was my approach. Try to do this with everybody I met. Respect them. Respect the person. Have warmth towards them as well as boundaries. See and treat every single one as human, not subhuman, even if some of their offences absolutely repulsed me. And I did, in my head, I believed deep down each person had potential even when it was really, really hard to see or impossible to see. I had this sense that deep down there was often, if not always, a lack of self-worth, a lack of motivation for understandable reasons, a lack of hope. 
that often they didn't love themselves. All the cliches, but true. This was the disease, something deep with inside each of them. What is this disease? What is this disease that applies not just to them, but the whole of humanity to each of us? What are we to turn away from, to repent of? I wonder if some of you are thinking, Mike, that's easy. Sin. Sin is the disease. Let me ask you another question. What comes to mind then when you think of sin, the sin that we need to turn from? What kind of things come to your minds? Perhaps greed? Sexual sins, violence, unloving use of the tongue, gossip, stealing things, that kind of stuff? Yes. Yes and no. I think they're the symptoms rather than the disease. The disease is much, much deeper. And in a nutshell, it's us living in a way we were not created to live. Us not living as we were created to be. Out of our essence, who we truly are. We were created good, tov, in the image and the likeness of God. Loving, relationally, of God, of others. Even, and this was a challenge, can you believe the challenge of Jesus in this call? Even our enemies, even the Romans who had done some horrendous stuff, and not to turn in violence, but to forgive. Wow, what a challenge, as it was then, as it is for us now. And to love ourselves in a healthy way, not a narcissistic way in a healthy way. This is the life, the light Jesus was proclaiming as opposed to darkness and death. Now, I don't know if you agree with me, some really wouldn't, but churches often teach that sin, the Greek word harmatia, is about missing the mark, falling short of a standard. And picture the archery the target at the end, and rather than getting the bullseye, <laughs> dropping short and missing the mark by our lack of morality and our sinful behaviour. It's so much more than this. The mark we are missing is by not living out of the essence of who we truly are, who God created us to be, our true self. William Paul Young, the author of The Shack, says this, The mark we miss is not perfect moral behaviour. The mark is the truth of your being. Sin is anything that negates or diminishes or misrepresents the truth of who you are, no matter how pretty or ugly that is. Behaviour becomes either authentic and an authentic way of expressing the truth of your good creation or an effort to cover up performance, behaviour, the shame of what you think of yourself. Worthless. Churches often teach the following, and I bet you've heard this so many times. Sin separates us from God. It creates this chasm. And you'll see street preachers and preachers then showing how the cross reaches over the chasm and allows us to come into relationship with God. I actually have come to the place where I believe that's a lie, a powerful lie, but a lie. And it's a lie that came into the story of the Garden of Eden. Because nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of God. Never could, never can. However, and this is it, 
We live as though we are separated from God. We believe the lie of separation and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and fuels our selfishness, our self-centeredness, our ego. We live out of the shadow, our false self, rather than our essence, the likeness of our Creator. That is the way of the world. What's the opposite of that? Kingdom living. And Jesus came to turn everything on its head, upside down or right side up, to heal humanity. So why do we focus on the symptoms so easily? Repent of personal sins. When I came to Worthing Baptist Church with Kate and family, 14 years ago, some of you will remember me doing this, but in the first few years I often joked that working with lifers and murderers had been good preparation for being a minister. But I wasn't joking. For the first seven years here, it was the most challenging time of my life. Much, much, much more than working in prisons. That's truth. Much harder. Even if church people stuff doesn't necessarily lead to criminal behaviour, and it might, it's not, they're criminals, we're goodies. People who make up churches are often just as complicated. Have just as complex issues. Act out just as much, but in different ways. And often lack self-awareness in the way that many of those I supervise lacked. And the lack of awareness, victim awareness, of impact on our behaviour on others. Even if in church we, look, we learn to look clean on the outside like the nice shiny cup. We use Christian speak. We can quote the Bible. And we dutifully give our time and money. Good stuff. But my challenging question this morning, why does the disease remain so endemic within churches? I would suggest it's often because within many churches, as Christians, we focus on the symptoms the behaviour, rather than the deeper stuff within. We focus on personal sins. Whatever list comes to mind of do's and don'ts that in our culture we decide are wrong or right. Don't do this, don't do that. We can become the morality police. And it's not all bad within churches by any means. But truth be told, often there is less personal transformation going on than we care to acknowledge. Christians are often, this is challenging stuff, no more loving than people who don't identify as Christian. One little caveat I'll put here, and as with the people I supervised in prisons, because I'm not God, you might have noticed, I can't always see the transformation in people. Sometimes it is clear. Sometimes you can spot a growing humility, a growing gentleness, a growing kindness, and that is so beautiful. And being transparent with you this morning, and this isn't a criticism of what went before, because I'm talking about my ministry here. Worthing Baptist Church is the healthiest I have ever known. You might recognise the fruit of the Spirit growing within yourself, or not. I can see the fruit in many of you. But my hunch, this is my hunch, that some of you, if not all of us, are frustrated, <laughs> disappointed with how hard it is to stay on top of our sins. 
Maybe some have even given up trying to change, trying to stop this, that or the other. And just when we think we're on top of it, it comes out in a different way or comes back in just the same way. It almost feels like the kingdom is near at hand, but not quite arrived within us. Can you relate to this? As we get older, we or maybe others might notice we're getting more grumpy. Oh. <laughs> more negative, more critical, more gossipy, more impatient, more lustful. Got a theory here. We're not getting worse. It's always been there within us. We just get less clever at covering it up. There's good news. It is never too late to be transformed from the depths of who we are more into the likeness of Christ. God's mercy and grace are truly new every day, however old we are, however long we have been walking the walk. How? Not so much about focusing on the symptoms, behaviour modification, but getting to the heart of the matter. Think about the Sermon on the Mount, Mount Beatitudes. It's not so much about what's out there, murder, I mean, it's important, but actually it comes from within the heart. The anger, the lust, comes from deep inside of us. So what about healing from the disease? Repentance. Going the wrong way, thinking the wrong way, and turning around. Because we are living out of our shadow, our full self, our ego, rather than the essence that I dare you to believe and trust is deep inside each of us. We are living independently from God rather than out of a relationship with God as though we are separated from God. As though our sin, our stuff, the moral stuff, has the power to separate us from Almighty God. It's not so much, and definitely not primarily, about turning from things, but turning to, turning to Jesus, the way of Jesus, love. Recognising that you, we are loved by God, created out of love, to be good. Your essence, I dare you to believe. The depths of who you are is good. Learning to live out of that. Allowing God by his spirit to root out the false self. Not once and for all, but on the ongoing journey. Allowing God to set you free daily. Sometimes by bringing that stuff into the light in order to heal us. It's more than focusing on external behaviour. It's mind, heart and behaviour. In one of our groups we have with some of the newer people at Worthing Baptist Church, uh, I was asked, Mike, do you have a high or low view of humanity? And we asked each other that. Both, as a probation officer for those years and as a minister for those years, I've seen stuff and I know how complex people are because I know how complex I am. I won't ask Kate this one, but as I get older, I notice more and more of my own imperfections. So am I getting worse? Don't answer that. <laughs> I truly hope not. I think it's all part of the spirit I trust going on within me. A deep work. Bringing my stuff into the light. Rooting out that ugly stuff. And it is scary. That's why it's so tempting, I don't know if you agree, for us to ignore that stuff. 
to stay unaware, blissfully ignorant, to deny it, to push it back down, carry on pretending, playing the game that we're nice, showing that the cup is clean on the outside, kind of like knowing the inside is a bit of a mess. The invitation is to trust God who wants to transform us from within. That's why at Pentecost the Spirit was sent. It really does help, I believe, if you believe, if I believe, that in essence you are good, contrary to many, many thousands of sermons over the years. Otherwise, there is this depth of shame about who you are deep down. The shame that came into the story of the Garden of Eden Eden, when they did something wrong, so they thought God deserted them. Uh, uh, uh. They thought they had to cover up. Uh, uh, uh. They thought God wasn't on their side. Uh, uh, uh. That is the lie. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. I think one of the things we need to repent of more and more is how we think about God because we get God so wrong. God is love. God gazes upon you with eyes of love and know you do not put God off by that stuff you sometimes think, feel and do. God sees your essence. Let me draw this together. Repentance, focusing on the disease rather than the symptoms. Focusing on Jesus. We hear it in church, every all edge talk, focusing on Jesus. Following Jesus daily in the way those invited first disciples followed. When Ant and I went to Israel, the first time I'd heard this analogy, but people wanted to follow their teacher, their rabbi, so closely that they'd be covered by the dust of their rabbi. You are that close to your teacher. I want to be so close to Jesus that the dust of Jesus covers me. And as we intentionally follow Jesus, get to know him better, what love really looks like, then rather than all this effort in our own strength, it happens from deep within if we are open. Of Matthew chapter 3 verse 8 says... Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Be who you were created to be from the overflow of who you truly are by the healing work of the Holy Spirit. Faith and repentance go together. Faith and repentance go together. Having faith, trusting in what Jesus came to do and accomplished through his death and resurrection. That is where we are given our healing. That is where we are forgiven of all, every single bit of that shadow stuff, that full stuff, that ugly stuff. It's already been forgiven. Past, present, future. The light has dawned. So we are free to live as the people God created us to be. Underneath those symptoms, underneath that kind of sin, underneath that serious disease. Live out of your essence today and tomorrow, as I will try to say, to do the same. You are, please listen to these words afresh, you, you are patient, you are kind, you are good, you are humble. You are forgiving. You are a truth teller. You are trustworthy. You have integrity. You are long suffering. You are loving. You keep no record of wrongs. You desire, in the depths of who you are, the best. You are pure of heart. This is the good news of the kingdom that Jesus came to bring about and he was proclaiming. Let's all sing and shout about it together. Let's proclaim it together. But first, let's dare to believe it more. Let's dare to live it.
through him. Amen. And invite Peter and Tash back.